and this is Matreya, my peer. And uh, the two of us work with customers to, uh, with the security leaders and security practitioners to develop strategy to deploy the architecture and then to help secure that architecture. And so what we're going to talk through today is kind of a quick snapshot of how you might think about controlling or doing compensating controls when you're talking about AI-specific applications. So just to kind of zero us in and ground us, what we're talking about in terms of first principles today is vulnerability or threat modeling, okay? And so many of you might be familiar, is anybody familiar with Adam Shostak? Okay, a few people in the crowd, right, who've done vulnerability work before. So Adam Shostak has uh, these four simple questions that he asks, you know, when you start to build out your vulnerability matrix, right? And so we're going to touch on the first three of these today, and that's what are we working on, what can go wrong, and what are we going to, what are we going to do about it, okay? So you might be doing this exercise uh, to your right, to uh, my left, over here is a, a security simulation exercise where they're doing tabletop here down, down the way. And that might be something that you would do as you start to build out that tabletop exercise, right, is to look at your industry, your specific environment, and think through, well, what are the types of vulnerabilities that are most common, you know, to customers like us, right, as we build out that tabletop. So um, anybody see the uh, keynote this morning? Raise your hands. Most of you, all of you? Okay, great. So you'll have seen this before. So uh, our Amazon CEO, Steve Schmidt, uh, walked through this. I'm just going to build it out quickly since most of you are familiar. So what you're seeing here from scope one through scope five, so from left to right, is the least amount of interaction with your data as a customer to the most interaction because you're actually creating the model yourself. So what we try to do with the scoping matrix is give common language. Frankly, in the first few months as we received a lot of questions or were working with customers and partners, what we noticed was kind of a lack of specificity. What are we talking about? It was just sort of like, how do you secure AI, right? A, which is a big bouncy question, right? So the, what the matrix does is it helps you zero in on well, what type of application are we talking about specifically, right? So on the left there, you have a consumer-based application uh, and all the way to, again, to a model that you're completely building out yourself. So I'll walk through the first two scopes and then Matreya will bring us home with the scopes three through five. So let's talk about the, the initial scope for a consumer application. Right? So for consumer application, candidly, you're going to be using the same coarse grain controls uh, that you would have used previously. Okay? So there's not a lot of interaction in scope one. Um, in scope two, you do look at, again, standard things like uh, cloud access security brokers or CASB, web proxies, data loss, uh, data mitigation strategies that you'd use in scope two. And uh, these are a little bit, now we're kind of getting narrower, right? So these are more fine-tuned. So let's talk about what this might look like, right? So we use one of our applications just because it's easy to talk through rather than choose somebody else's application, right? So one of the things you might do at the scope two stage is to look at role-based access controls. And again, these are not new ideas, right? So what we're saying really in scope one and scope two is it's a little bit of business as usual, right? These are just the same best practices or, or best procedures that you've used in your environment previously. And what we find at the executive level, if we ask CISOs what's the most common or, or most recent question that the board of directors uh, or the subcommittee asked you, it's how do we secure AI? Like that is absolutely top of mind for most uh, large enterprises at least. And what we want to do here is reassure the community, but, but probably your customers as well, that really the generative AI applications themselves, particularly at scope one and scope two, really are not fundamentally different, right? And in the wild, as it were, we have not seen really a host of new vulnerabilities. So in other words, the same best practices or the same top 10 that we've been talking about for a number of years, those are still the best things that you can do to ensure that you're safe. So let's just talk about role-based access control, or RBAC. So here's an example where how you're going to be using the, the AI tool or application itself will help determine what kinds of controls do you need to use. So if you're using a, a customer service, a customer service rep is using an application, say for uh, insurance, they might have access to insurance documents. So in this case, the customer is an automotive customer, and so that type of a role may need access to different types of documents or applications, right? And you might be using something like RAG, or retrieval augmented uh, generation, to grab that information, right? So it's really important to think about, well, what is the role? Because the role of your user, even if it's an internal user, is really going to drive what access to data do they need. 
and, and in a different role so that I'm a customer service rep, right, I might be able to access documents internal to my company that are related to e-commerce. I might be able to access invoices, right, or, or payment information. But again, if I'm a technician, I might not have access to that, right? So this is scope one, really consumer application. Not a lot for you to do other than the normal controls that you would use. And as you get into scope two, now you start to think about, well, what are the access rights that I need to have based on the role and then put compensating controls in for those scopes. So that's a little bit about vulnerabilities, um, some of the, cop, the, the top three questions that you want to ask and address, and how you can step through scope one and scope two. And what I'm going to have uh, Matreya do is he's going to walk through scopes three through five. And because this is a lightning talk, because there's often a lot of questions, so we'll be available uh, after uh, here on the side of the stage. So with that, I'll hand it off to Matreya. Thank you, Dutch. So what Dutch gave you an idea was of scope one and two. We call that the buy side of the house because you're actually purchasing some sort of application. What I'm going to actually talk to you about is three, four, and five, which is closer to the build side of the house. So in this case, let's take an example of scope three. If you remember, scope three is all about using what we call pre-trained models or off-the-shelf foundation models, so things like language models. So what I want to actually take you to is a use case from the automotive world. Imagine that you have a... Uh, you're an automotive manufacturer, and you want to enable the technicians who work on your vehicles to actually troubleshoot issues really fast and get access to root causes, remediations, and fixes really quickly. So you can actually give them a whole bunch of manuals from multiple different uh, providers, multiple different suppliers, and they'll spend a lot of time searching through that. So what you want to do is build a chat, a chat bot system where you can actually speed their work up, right? So this is the interactive diagnostics manual application that you might want to build. So let's see how you might actually build that. So we first start with the pre-trained model. So this is a model in yellow, which is provided by the model provider, and that's something that you're using off the shelf. You're not customizing the model in any way yet in scope three, but what you're doing is you're building an application like the diagnostics manual application. And what you're also doing is bringing your information. This is your proprietary information, like the diagnostics manuals, the guides, the troubleshooting, and the fixes. And that's what you bring on the top of this diagram. So let's see how the technician's flow might work. So they might have had a vehicle that throws up a diagnostic code. They might ask, saying, what is the root cause of this diagnostic code? Your application takes that request and then searches for relevant documentation pages using semantic search. You might use a vector database, you might use some other technology to find the relevant pages that are relevant to this particular diagnostic code. You take those pages and your application packages all of that together into the context that it sends to a language model. So you have instructions, you have relevant pages, and the customer's question, the user's question, to the model, and ask the model to now satisfy that request. Summarize the response, and now the model goes off and does its job, and it provides information back that then can be fed back to the diagnostic technician. So the technician now has some possible root causes, they have some possible troubleshooting steps, and they can proceed very quickly to fix the issue. Right? So if you see here, the important part I want to mention here is that this is a pattern called retrieval augmented generation, or RAG. So your application is the one that's retrieving relevant information. So as you can imagine, if you put on your threat modeling hat, that is where you need to be very careful about what you retrieve in response to this particular user. If they are authorized to look at vehicles that are of a certain type, you should only provide information that is relevant and specific to those vehicle types, right? So let's look at some controls that you might apply. So just like any application, this happens to be an application, you might expose it on the web. So traditional threat modeling, traditional application security absolutely applies. But because it happens to be a generative AI application, you may have some additional considerations. So for example, you want to make sure that if you have a model, such as the large language model that we had in the previous diagram, you want to make sure that the access control to that model is protected. You control access to the inference endpoint to make sure that only authorized applications are allowed to invoke the model, both for security as well as for cost reasons, because it costs you every time you invoke the model. Right? Now another thing to remember is today's technologies does not allow you to have fine-grained access control on the data that the model was trained on. So if you had two data sets, the model was trained on that. If you make an inference call, you can't actually say, please answer based on precisely this data set. You can't have a hard control. So sort of the rule of thumb here is, if something has made its way into the model weights, 
it can and will come out. So don't use your model as your security boundary. Use your application to enforce those boundaries using the retrieval stage as we saw, right? Filter inputs and outputs, I'll show you some examples of that. You want to make sure that the input and the outputs are appropriate to your use case, and some harmful or inappropriate content is filtered out, and I'll show you an example of that. And then some traditional technologies that you might have used to protect your infrastructure, things like WAF, to do things like rate limiting, as well as to look at things like SQL injection, still do apply to Scope 3 applications as well. So to show you an example of how you would filter harmful content, this is a screenshot from Bedrock Guardrails feature, which shows you how you can set these sliders to filter and detect harmful content of different types. So for example, toxicity, hate, or even attempt to inject prompts into the uh, request can be detected, and you can actually reject such requests so you protect your application from being affected by these types of attempts. Right? So again, we recommend that you look at the controls that your services provide and turn those on. Right? You have to actually explicitly turn these guardrails on, and we highly recommend that you look at that. Now let's imagine that you have used that application for a while, and you realize that it's giving answers, but it could be much better if it knew a lot more about automotive terminology. Right? So there's specific product names, specific technologies, and a general model may not have been trained on that. So what you do is you take the next step to say, I'm going to fine-tune the model, to now introduce it to automotive terminology and to example chat sequences so it knows what I'm trying to do better, right? So that's the step you take to now emerge into scope four where you're fine tuning the model. So you again start with the model that was trained by the model provider. This is the off the shelf model. But then you introduce terminology, things like glossaries, your sample uh, transcripts, and then you fine tune the model and customize the model on that particular data. What's happening here is now the model weights change. So they actually now represent some form of the data that you introduce to that. And that is why we color this in pink to denote the fact that this is now in your control as a customer. The application pretty much stays the same. And so the flow looks like this. It's exactly the same as before. You retrieve relevant pages. You provide the instructions. But the response that comes back can be better or more suited to your domain because the model has been exposed to terminology and examples, right? So your enhanced application can do a better job of responding to your technicians with automotive terminology that perhaps the off-the-shelf model did not know about, right? So you have an enhanced app, which is now using a fine-tuned model, as you can see in the middle, right? So since this is still an application, which is a derivative of scope three, a lot of the concerns that you looked at in scope three will still apply, but the big difference here is that you have a fine-tuned or customized model. This model has weights that represent the data you supplied. Those could be proprietary data, those could be intellectual property, so you really want to protect that fine-tuned model artifact, as well as protect the fine-tuned model's inference endpoint to a higher degree, because only applications that should be allowed to invoke that model should be given the permissions to do so. Right? So you need to make sure that you protect those fine-tuned artifacts and the model inference endpoint. And with AWS, if you're using Bedrock to do your model hosting, you can actually do that very efficiently using IAM, as we'll see in this example here. So this is a snippet of an IAM identity policy, which actually has two actions, if you'll see. The first one actually grants access to a customized model. So when you customize a model, you actually get a model ID. So you can actually be very granular and say that this entity or this identity can actually invoke this particular model, and you can deny all others if you want. And the second thing you can do is you can actually encrypt those customized models using AWS KMS keys that you control. So in order for somebody to actually invoke inference, they need to have permissions both to the model as well as to the key in order for them to actually successfully inference against that, right? So you have two places to control who can access your model and perform actions on that, right? So IAM and KMS can be effective controls to protect things like customized models in Bedrock, right? And so again, different services will have different capacities, so you have to actually see what you can use to protect your models in other services. So that was scope four in a nutshell. We took an off-the-shelf model and customized it for an application use case like an automotive use case. Now let's look at scope five. As you can imagine, all the different boxes that we were looking at so far are all colored pink. What that means is those are all in your control as a customer. You decide what data you'll start with to, to train your model. You also decide whether you want to do customization or fine tuning. And of course, as before, you control the application as well. 
So if you can imagine here, you might use tools like SageMaker to collect a whole lot of training data to create your own foundation models. So it really matters what that data is, right? So everything depends on how you selected that data and how you control that data, where you source it from, and your model behavior will depend upon that. Again, the rule of thumb here is if the model was, the model weights represent the training data. So if something went into the weights, you should assume that it can and will come out. So you want to make sure that the model artifacts are protected. So let's see what controls apply to you. So in scope five, remember, you become the model provider, right? So all the concerns that were the model provider's concerns in the previous scopes become your concerns. The first thing of that is, of course, choosing what training data you want to use and how you source that data and what that contains. So things like bias, safety, responsible AI principles, all of those are your responsibility to apply. So it's very important that when you use data, if you're using your own data, you want to make sure that you protect those artifacts very carefully. Another thing to mention here is that when you think about training a model, that training data actually gets represented in weights in some fashion, but you can't actually go to the model and say, remove one particular line or one particular record that was in the training model, right? So you have to actually retrain the model again to remove some data elements. So what that means is you have to be really, really careful about the types of data you want to include in your training data set. If you include PII and someone comes along and says, I would like my PII to be removed, you actually have to do the training all over again. So it's very important to be very careful about the types of data that you then include in your training process. So kind of the key takeaways now. So what we looked at was the scoping matrix, which you saw potentially in the keynote, as well as we looked at it today. So we see that as a great way for you to actually have a common language and a common terminology that you can use to understand what type of application we're talking about. Is it something that's a consumer app? Or is it scope five, where we're building everything or something in between? It's very likely in our conversations, most customers tend to be in scope three and four when they're building, or scope two when they're purchasing, right? So it's important to understand where you sit and then the controls that apply to the scope that you're looking at, right? We also looked at how you can apply technical controls and I'm emphasizing technical because you saw examples of using things like features in queue business to separate access to different parts of the indexed data. You saw examples of using bedrock guardrails to kind of safely remove harmful or inappropriate content. You also saw examples of how you can use IAM and KMS to control access to models. So we highly encourage you to use a combination of these that apply to the types of application you're trying to protect. An important note here is that not all controls are going to be technical. So in fact, NIST CSF, the cybersecurity framework, actually explicitly acknowledges that. In the latest version 2.0, they actually introduced an entirely new function called govern, which is all about processes, people, training, basically preparing your organization to adopt technologies in a safe manner. Right? So it goes way beyond technical controls. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that controls are always technical. Do keep in mind that there are also non-technical govern-type controls that you might want to apply to protect your generative AI applications. So that, in a nutshell, was what I want you to take away. So use the scoping matrix, use the controls, and protect your application based on the scope that it applies to. Thank you. We'll be around at the later for any questions that you might have. Perfect.